Brought to you as a public service by your cable or satellite provider. American History TV continues now with a discussion on George Washington's character. We heard how General Washington related to his fellow soldiers and how he viewed himself during the American Revolution. We also examined George Washington's legacy and how we remember him today. This lasts about an hour. Okay, today what we're planning to do is spend a little time talking about George Washington and the character that he developed over a lifetime. And if you think about what we've done for the uh, duration of this course, we've, we've brought him into the story intermittently throughout, whether it's talking about individual battles or whether it's talking about how he organized men or how he kept men, he recruited men to get them to maintain or re, uh, stay in the service. And one of the things I, I try to get across whenever I'm talking about Washington is that Washington is a bit of an enigma to, to a modern audience. Why? Because we really don't know who he was, what he was, how he looked. I mean, when I show you these images here, these images are are of three of our noteworthy presidents. Every 10 years or so, uh, about 700 political scientists and historians across the country, they rank our presidents. Now, who knows how our current president is going to rank, but nonetheless, whenever those rankings come out, generally, these three guys here rank at the top. Sometimes it'll be Lincoln, Sometimes it'll be Washington, sometimes it'll be FDR. But the interesting thing about this is that we do not know what George really looked like. We have images of Lincoln, photograph images, and you can follow those photographs over time and see how he, he changed, how he aged. And, of course, we have images of FDR. I mean, we even have some images of him in his wheelchair and... Generally, the press did not take images of him in his wheelchair. But with George Washington, he was there before photography. So we don't have photographs of him. And what we have instead is artist representations. And those artist representations are not always very accurate. I mean, you look at some representational abstract art, and does it really look like a cube? I don't know. Maybe not. Well, George Washington, we've spent the better part of 14 weeks already kind of addressing him, talking about him. Um, we know that he is a famous man. He, we know he was commander of the Continental Army. We know that he had served in the Continental Congress for a short period of time before he accepted command. We know that he is subsequently going to become president, first president of the United States. So obviously he is a, a famous man in our history. But he's also a man who had faults, a man who had insecurities, a man who had vices. He's a man who was a human being just like all of us. And because he was a human being, he was also a complex man, a many-sided man. And the problem with paintings is they don't show that kind of complex character. What I want to do is spend a little time talking about the myths of George Washington. And then we will then talk about how he made choices that ultimately brought him to the point where he became the most revered man in America. Well, you probably know that George is considered the father of our country. But you know, George, when he married Martha, he wasn't able to sire children. He, he wasn't able to give Martha children? And could he really be the father of our country if he couldn't sire children himself? 
I mean, and think about when the, the country decided to make a monument to him. What do they choose to make? The monument is this, this giant phallic-shaped symbol, which um, is kind of ironic for the man who couldn't sire children himself. But even though he couldn't, here is the George Washington show with Martha's children. And uh, when he married Martha, he did accept her children. And he became a paternalistic, loving father to her children. So in that respect, you know, it shows the character of a, of a person who accepted her children. It showed paternalism, acceptance. Now, most of the stories that we have of Washington came from the first real biography of Washington, written by Mason, Mason Weems, Mason Locke Weems. And it was published just shortly after Washington's death. And the Washington that Weems talks about is a man that is like Thor, a man who was larger than life. I mean, Weems talks about George Washington throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac River. A couple of problems with that story. The first is, anybody, there were no silver dollars. So how could he throw a silver dollar that didn't exist? The second, the Potomac River where Mount Vernon is, is about a mile wide. I don't care if you're Nolan Ryan or Roger Clemens. You're probably not going to throw a silver dollar across a mile wide river. Well, one of Washington's grandsons, did say that as a young man, George Washington had thrown a piece of slate across his, the river at his childhood home, which was on the Rappahannock. The Rappahannock, not quite as wide. And you know what happens when you throw slate? If you throw it right, it'll skim and bounce across the river. So that might have been possible. But what Weems is trying to do is give you an image of a man who is larger than life, who had this great physical ability, this great athletic prowess. We know that George is a large man. He stood about six foot three, about my height. He, he had a, a long straight nose, high cheekbones. Uh, at his heaviest, he was significantly less than I am. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood 220 or so. And at his lightest, he was probably about 175, 180. You know, at that day and age, they didn't have the obesity problems that we experience today. But virtually every school kid learns that George Washington had what kind of teeth? Wooden. Wooden false teeth. Yeah, and that is just absolutely wrong. I mean, here you can see his, a pair of his dentures. And what's interesting about it, you notice right here, that's a spring. It's a lead base that is spring-loaded so that when you put this in, your jaw keeps it shut, and when your mouth opens, the spring pops it open. The teeth themselves are animal teeth, human teeth, pieces of ivory. And I am convinced if you had to wear that thing in your mouth, it would probably be far more uncomfortable than wooden teeth. Well, it's those teeth here that always play a central role in Washington's life. You'll see right here, there's no tooth there. Because even at the time of his presidency, George had one of his own teeth. And the dentures slipped right down over the tooth. So he's able to highlight his tooth as well. Well, that mouth and those teeth become a big part of the story about who George Washington is. Now, 
This portrait right here, this portrait, one of the most famous of Washington, is done by the artist Gilbert Stuart. Stuart, when he painted Washington at this time, he was a young painter. This was one of his earliest commissions. And Stuart was just absolutely terrified to meet the great general. So during the setting, Stuart tried to make Washington more at ease. He said something to the effect of to Washington, General Washington, you must let yourself forget that you are General Washington and I am Stuart the painter. Well, Washington gave a well-intentioned reply. He said something to the fact that well, there's no need for me to forget that I am General Washington and you, you are but Stuart the painter. Kind of insulted Stuart. He felt that Washington was giving him a backhanded slap. Well, because of that, Gilbert Stuart got to portray Washington. One of those images that we have of him. And this is one of the most famous. And when you look at that, what is the central feature of that painting. What is it? The mouth. Look at it. It's kind of clenched. And it looks like he's in some discomfort, some kind of pain. And from that image, the view that we have of Washington is that he is glum, that he is awkward, he is unapproachable, he is grumpy perhaps, and that is not so. He wasn't a square-jawed stiff shirt as this image of Washington by Stuart portrays him. I mean, the George Washington that we know that historians have documented, was a George Washington who loved to have a good time. But you remember what I've told you about Washington, is that he believed that there's the personal man and then there's the public man. And those people who had the personal relationship would not display that personal relationship in public. The private man had a public persona. And you stayed outside of arm's reach. Well, this is a George Washington who enjoyed playing cards. He enjoyed cockfights, horse races. This is the George Washington who loved to dance. It was reported that George was the best dancer in all of Virginia. This is the George Washington who loved to hunt and fish. He loved going to the theater. In fact, his favorite play was Tragedy of Cato. And if you know anything about this performance, it's the story of a young selfless patriot who sacrifices himself to the greater patriot cause. Maybe because Washington felt that he was that guy. He also liked Hamlet he also liked Julius Caesar. Those were a couple of his favorites. And this was the George Washington who had an eye for the attractive women. In the 18th century, she was considered an attractive woman. Not only was she an attractive woman, she was the, the widow of a gentleman. And she was very wealthy. So George is going to end up marrying up. He is not this square-jawed stuffed shirt. He's not unapproachable. But he is the man that is going to keep himself in proper decorum. And I've referenced this to you several times about how he couldn't control his anger. He always had trouble controlling his anger. 
And this particular episode happens during the Constitutional Convention, and we'll reference it again on Thursday. How Governor Morris, a New Yorker, a man of questionable virtue, was good friends and drinking buddies with Alexander Hamilton. And Governor Morris was boasting that he could treat Washington just like he would treat any other of his best friends. And Morris and Hamilton made a wager. Hamilton said if Morris could treat him, treat Washington like any other friend in public, then Hamilton would buy dinner and wine for Morris and 12 of his friends. Well, on the night in question, a public event, George Washington, as we know, will become the president of the Constitutional Convention, and he was hosting an event that evening, and Governor Morris comes in. It was a public event, a big crowd. Governor Morris comes in, and he immediately reaches out his hand to shake George's hand. A gentleman would do that. But as they shook hands, Morris took that second hand and brought it up and began patting George on the shoulder and saying, General Washington, my dear friend, it's so good to see you looking so well. What had happened, that familiarity, Washington pulled his hand back. He took three steps back. And he just glared at Morris with this evil, angry stare. And the people who were there froze. They simply stood and watched. And Morris slinked off into the crowd. Morris later told Hamilton that I had won the bet. I will collect my wine and dinner but that is nothing I will ever do again because Morris and Washington would never be close enough that Morris could come up and pat him on the shoulder and treat him with the familiarity that you would treat a close personal acquaintance. Well, that's because Washington maintained that dignity, that personal space. Now... Did that mean that Washington had an uncontrollable anger he could not control? No. It just means that he believed in proper decorum. Now, probably the greatest or most famous image of George, which was not done during his lifetime, this image here, does it look familiar? Where's the original? Down the street at the Eamon Carter Museum. Absolutely. Go down and take a look at it. But this came in the, from the story of Mason Weems. Mason Weems says that the young George, for his sixth birthday, his father gave him a, a new hatchet. And the young boy was so excited about getting this gift that he went around and began barking in literally every tree he could find. And he barked one of his father's favorite English cherry trees. And when his father approached him, according to Weems, young George simply threw his hands up and said, I did it, father. You know I cannot tell a lie. Well, that's the image that school kids for the last 200 plus years have been told. This 1939 painting by Grant Wood, which as I said is down at the Eamon Carter Museum just about a mile or so away from here, shows Mason Weems pulling back the curtain and it shows the young George being truthful to his father. But the thing that I find particularly interesting about this image is look. The same head as you have on the dollar bills. 
That's the young head. This is the old head. But they essentially look the same. Now, the interesting thing about this story, never happened. There is no evidence that this ever happened. Weems had simply made the story up to portray Washington as a man of great honesty. That even when the trouble might bring problems for young George, he had to be honest to his father. Well, Weems also tells us another story about the young George Washington, the surveyor, who is out on the frontier and bad weather is setting in. He finds a, a local tavern where he can spend the night. And he goes in and he orders a, a, a dram of whiskey. And the barkeep gives him a dram of whiskey and George offers a, a skin. He offers a coon skin in payment. Well, the barkeep takes the coon skin and in return gives Washington 158 rabbit skins. That's a lot of rabbit skins to carry around. Well, according to Weems, George began buying drinks for everyone in the establishment. And during the evening, he turned 158 rabbit skins back over to the barkeep. Now, what Weems is trying to tell us in that story is that this is the George Washington who was generous. This is the George Washington who is kind. This is the George Washington that we want to remember. So you think of these images that Weems has been telling us. He's honest. He has this great physical skill. He is generous and kind. He has a temper but he can control it. Well, this is the man that has come down to us as the, you know, more or less the savior of American mankind. You know, this is the story of the man who, remember how we talked about providential inspiration? This is George as providential inspiration. And even some years later, Chief Justice Joseph Story made the comment from his commentaries on the Constitution that George was the boast of all America, the first in war, the first in peace, and the first in the hearts of his countrymen. So what makes him first in the heart of his countrymen? Well... George, as a young man, before the scope of this course, you know, George is born on February 11th, 1731. Is that the day we celebrated his birthday? No. That was the Julian calendar. And in the early 1750s, They changed through the Gregorian calendar. So it moved his birthday 11 days ahead. So February 22nd, 1731. And as a young man, he was obsessed with becoming a gentleman. And what did a gentleman entail? It meant having wealth, owning property, potentially owning slaves, having a spouse, being successful. Well, the young George, when he was 11, his father died. And young George ended up having to live with his older half-brother, Lawrence. Now, Lawrence was a gentleman. He had a, a grand home that he had named after Admiral Edward Vernon, who had served under during Queen Anne's, uh, uh, King George's War, pardon me. Um, and from that, young George saw what it meant to be a gentleman. He saw that status equated to wealth. So he wanted to become wealthy. And 
You remember time and again I've said that George is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he does learn from others. And while he was staying with his half-brother, he learned that he too could become successful if he made the right choices. So as a young man, he became a surveyor. And at the time, being a surveyor was on par with a doctor, a lawyer, because surveyors were always going out on the frontier to survey land. And if you're good at it, you have a trained eye. You see the land that is advantageous, the land that is not. And oftentimes you could take your payment in land. Land is something that could bring wealth for the future. So the young man began acquiring land. Now, the problem is, in 1752, Lawrence died. And the question was, who would inherit Mount Vernon? Ultimately, one of Lawrence's daughters inherited it she died shortly thereafter and it passed down to young George so by 1753 here was a guy who had this grand plantation home and this is the view that most of us have of Mount Vernon that view is the view from the veranda the porch looking out onto the Potomac River Is that the front of the house? Or is that the front of the house? That's the other side. Well, you know, it's interesting. When Lawrence was alive, he considered the front of the house this. Because it was there on the Potomac River. The Potomac was the highway to the sea. The sea took you to England. And he saw himself as an Englishman. As George takes over the home, George will consider this to be the front of the house because this faces to the frontier. That faced to the land that he would eventually own. Well, I think that's a huge difference for Lawrence and for George. And it helps to find really who George is. George saw himself not so much as an Englishman, but more as an American. George also had the good fortune in 1758 to marry Martha Dandridge Custis who reportedly was the wealthiest woman in Virginia. And by marrying her, he married the, the widow of a gentleman. So by marrying her, George became a gentleman. And with her wealth and with his drive and determination to secure wealth, the Washingtons would become one of the wealthiest couples in America. He was a plantation owner, farmer, initially growing tobacco, but coming to the realization that tobacco was a leaching crop that was declining in value. So by the time of the revolution, what was he starting to cultivate? Wheat. Remember you guys read Breen's book, Tobacco Culture, how the tobacco culture was playing out. Well, this is the George Washington who by the time of his death will own 11,000 acres. He had this ambition for wealth that made him acquisitive, made him sometimes contentious. And even after he'd established himself, he would insist upon exact payment of every debt owed to him. In his youth, 
young George wanted to be a British military officer. And at the beginning of this course, remember, we had made reference to how young George was the guy who started the Seven Years' War. There at Humanville Glen, when Half King had killed the young French diplomat, and then George rescued the remaining French prisoners. But then he himself would be captured at Fort Necessity in July. And with that, he was forced to sign a document written in what language? French which George doesn't read. And in that document, he accepts responsibility for the death of Ensign Humanville. Well, because of that, George felt that he had to redeem himself. And during the Seven Years' War, he positioned himself. He negotiated to try to secure a British officer's commission. And in fact, General Edward Braddock promised him an officer's commission. And he was on that expedition with Braddock. And then, of course, what happened? The disaster failed miserably. The French and Indians attacked, decimated the British force. Braddock would be killed. Washington would lead the survivors back to safety. And Braddock's successor... Jeffrey Amherst would not honor that commitment to give Washington an officer's commission. And because of that, young George felt, he felt that he and other colonials would always remain in a subservient position. A subservient position as long as they were British subjects. Well, he would finally get the commission he sought, but it wouldn't be until 1775. And it would not be a British Army commission. Instead, it would be commander of continental forces in this revolutionary protest. And as he takes command of the Continental Army, young George told told the politicians he would not accept pay for his service. However, he did expect that his expenses would be reimbursed. And in fact, through the course of the war, year after year, George will be reappointed year after year as the commander. Even though people like Horatio Gates and people like Charles Lee were angling to have Washington replaced, Washington stays in command. He doesn't take the pay, but he does accept expenses for his travel. And in fact, every winter, Martha would come stay with him. And in fact, at one point, Washington even asked for expense, her expenses because she's there. She keeps him entertained, keeps him happy, and also works to make the plight of the troops better. Well... Over the last eight weeks or so, we've talked about how Washington was as a military commander. And we pointed out that if you were a football coach here in Texas, he would be fired. You know, a record of 3-9-1. and one. And we've kind of detailed what engagements he won, you know. But if you're 3-9-1, and one, how do you keep men willing to fight for you? How do you keep them willing to sacrifice for the, the larger cause? Well, that's what George was good at. George was good at motivating men, convincing them that the cause they were fighting for was larger than them themselves. Those three victories he won, of course, you remember the New York campaign where he had been beaten, battered, and bruised in Brooklyn, and he had been driven over to Manhattan Island, driven as far north as White Plains, then rushing south, just, just with Lord Cornwallis's cavalry, 
nipping at his heels. And they crossed the Delaware River in 1776. What Washington learned from that, during the New York campaign, Washington had divided his army and the British had used concentrated force to crush those smaller pieces. Washington, the one thing you can say about Washington, he's not a military genius, but he learns from his mistakes. And he surrounds himself with capable people and he listens to their suggestions. And what he learned from that New York campaign, when you divide your army, you make yourself susceptible to the enemy. Well, as his army crossed over the Delaware, he would begin striking at the divided British army. Remember, as I showed you that image, that George was probably hunched down in the, in the barge, hanging on for dear life. Can you imagine one of those ice flows hit the boat, tumps him out? That probably wouldn't be a, a refreshing experience. But nonetheless, his army did cross over. They attacked the British, the Hessians at Trenton. They scored an easy victory, six Americans wounded. A week later, he engaged British forces at Trenton. Oh, pardon me, at Trent, at Princeton, I'm sorry. He engaged British forces at Trent, at Princeton. Jeez, I'm having a hard time saying that. Um, and wins a victory there. So by the early part of 77, he has won two of his three victories. Now, you remember what that tie was. That was Monmouth Courthouse in the summer of 1778 as the British evacuated Philadelphia and marched back to New York. Remember, Washington wanted to attack the rear guard of the British. And when Charles Lee refused to engage the rear guard, Washington took command himself. And during the day, they fought the British to a standstill in that stifling summer heat. That was his tie. The Americans held the battlefield, but the British had an, a, a tactical victory because they were able to evacuate their armies to New York. And then that third victory, it's like winning the play on the last game, la, winning the game on the last play of the game, you know, throwing that long TD pass. Now, if he had been coach at TCU and he beat Texas on that last play, even at 3-9-1, he would probably be retained. But nonetheless, winning that victory at Yorktown four years after the great victory at Saratoga, that was the event that brought an end to the struggle. There were still negotiations to take place. The British still occupied. But George had kept the men in the field. He had kept them committed to the cause. He had shown that while he wasn't a military genius, he was a competent tactician. He was persistent. He's a natural leader of men. He was a guy who was able to convince those soldiers time and time and time again to renew their enlistment. Remember Joseph Plum Martin. Joseph Plum Martin, time and again, what did he do? He re-enlisted because the cause was bigger than him. And here is a guy who had built his entire life on acquiring things, becoming richer and holding more land and becoming a gentleman and, you know, grabbing hold of things. And he had been pretty good at it. For George makes a name for himself, where he cements his place in history, is not where he grabs things, but where he instead lets things go. In fact, remember last Thursday we were talking about the trials and tribulations of the Articles period. 
the economy was sour and there was political incompetency. incompetency. There was no sense of political control. And yet, soldiers were still in the field because the British hadn't quite evacuated New York yet. And there north of the city, near West Point, was the the encamped American army at Newburgh. And there, soldiers were grumbling, especially the officers. They were led to believe that they were not going to be paid for their time. They were not going to be paid for their service. They were going to simply be dismissed and wiped away. Well, Washington understood that. He understood their frustration, their anger. And on March 15th, 1783, Washington would, he would go to the, the cantonment there and meet with officers. There was a circular letter that had been floated among the officer corps in which they suggested that the officers rise up and march on the civilian government and seize control. In fact, a year before, a Continental c- colonel named Louis Nicola in May of 82 had written George a letter in which he suggested that George use the army and seize power and make himself a king, a more or less a dictator. And Washington had read that letter and was mad as hell. He wrote a scathing reply to Nicola. And when Nicola got Washington's reply, he sent three letters back to Washington over time, persistently apologizing for such a suggestion. Now, he was loyal to his commander, and he was loyal to his government. So on March 15th, on that day, George spent the entire day crafting a speech, agonizing over every word that he was going to say to those officers. And that evening... He went to the cantonment to the officers' meeting. And as he came in, these were battle-trained soldiers. These are men who had served with George throughout much of the conflict. And as he went in, their cold, icy stares almost froze George himself. He was friends with a lot of these men, but yet you would never know by the look on their faces. And as George began to speak, He tried to explain to these officers the larger cause they were fighting for and how they should remain loyal to that cause. And he looked out and there was still this icy stare at them. He remembered he had a letter in his jacket from the Continental Congress, another letter where the Congress was promising the officers would be paid and they would be given their their land as promised. So he pulled that letter out, and he opened it up because he was going to read it to them. And then all of a sudden, he paused. And he quietly made the comment, I've already grown gray in the service of my country. Now it seems I'm going blind. And all of a sudden, those icy stares melted what George had just done he admitted his frailty he admitted his weakness he admitted his vulnerability that he had sacrificed so much for this cause that even his health was declining and as he looked out over the crowd Many of those battle-hardened soldiers had tears in their eyes. George simply folded up the letter, put it back in his coat, never read it, and walked out of the, the, uh, out of the, the uh, meeting. The officers then voted unanimously to remain loyal to George and remain loyal to their government. In fact, one of George's staff officers one of his staff officers made the comment some years later 
that the United States are indebted for the Republican form of government solely to the firm and determined Republicanism of General Washington at that time. That was a political performance, and George had played it to a T. He had the chance to become king, King George I of America, and he did not accept it. In fact, nine months later, George Washington traveled to Annapolis, Maryland. And there he would finally, once and for all, surrender his sword to the civilian government. You can say that perhaps this is his greatest achievement. Because as he arrived there that morning, he had already said farewell to his, his troops, his staff officers, and he rode into Annapolis that day alone. He entered into the Maryland State House. And you can go to this room today. When I taught at the Naval Academy some years ago, I took my students there to show them this momentous setting. Well, there the Continental Congress, or the Articles Congress, I should say, had convened. The galleries were full. Of course, what you see there in the background is, see that white-haired lady up there? Who's that supposed to be? In the artist depiction, it's supposed to be Martha. Martha wasn't there. She was back at Mount Vernon waiting for her husband to get back for Christmas time. There were not throngs of women there in the galleries. The building was near full, but certainly Martha was not there. And ultimately, when Washington arrived, President Mifflin, Thomas Mifflin, the president of the Articles Congress that year, he welcomed the general. And he read a statement, a statement that had been drafted by Thomas Jefferson. But before that statement, before Mifflin read that statement, Washington himself rose, having now finished the work assigned to me, I retire from the great theater of action, and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body, under whose orders I have so long acted, I here offer my commission and take my leave from of all the employments of public life. Mifflin then rose and read his statement in which he said, You've conducted the great military contest with wisdom and fortitude, invariably regarding the rights of the civil power through all disasters and changes. What Washington had done had not been done in a thousand years. Washington had all the power. He had control of the military, and he had simply turned it loose. In fact, he surrendered his sword. He left the Maryland State House, mounted his horse, rode off to Mount Vernon. He was there by Christmas time. The idea that the young man who had wanted everything and yet who had given up the ultimate prize, so to speak, that attests to the growth and development of that young man's character. You know, a man who made the right decisions for the right reason. And of course, after this episode, we know what will happen. As we will see on Tuesday, the, a constitutional convention. And then we will see, after the extent of this course, that George will become the first president of the United States. And he will only serve two terms, even though people wanted him to serve more terms. He established an unofficial two-term tradition that politicians would follow until 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Of course, that was the crisis of World War II as well. One of the more interesting scenarios that happened after Washington had retired from president, a young painter, a young American painter named Benjamin West, was actually in Britain, and he was commissioned to paint a portrait of King George, an aging King George III. And George, making small talk with Benjamin West, he said, now this general you had, George Washington, what is he doing now? And Benjamin West said, well, he has retired to private life and he's returned to his farm in Virginia and he is a private citizen. And George III kind of looked surprised and said something to the effect, if Washington could do this, he is the greatest man in the world. He had done that. He simply walked away when he had everything in his hands. And I think when you combine all these stories about Washington and you see the choices that he makes, you start to see the development of his character. The choices that he made for the betterment of his nation rather than for the betterment of him. That is the type of character that a photograph or even that a, a portrait cannot portray. So, we'll open up the floor for questions now. Any questions, guys? You make up questions, I'll make up answers. No, no, no. No, okay, up here. How did they select George to be the commander of the Continental Army? Well, uh, George had attended the Continental Congress wearing a military uniform. And, you know, he had served in the Seven Years' War. He saw himself as a military man. He had read extensively about military treatises. And as he traveled to the Continental Congress, most of those in the Congress understood at that time, 1774 and 75, that these colonies were on the path to war. So Washington was going to be prepared. And as he wore his uniform, he was making a statement that he was prepared to be the commander of this military force. And it's interesting that John Adams would make the nomination. And as he was making the nomination, his cousin Samuel Adams was sitting over there. It looked like he'd eaten a cat. He was, had such a smile on his face. Because Samuel was convinced that his cousin was going to nominate him to be the commander of the military. But he nominated George because that brought Virginia into the struggle. The most populous, the, the biggest, the most important colony. And by doing so, it broadened the conflict from New England to the mid-Atlantic in the south. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, when did, like, the official recruitment for soldiers begin, and was it George who, like, initiated that? No. Uh, the Continental Congress issued a plea for, for soldiers. And, yeah, and throughout the war, the Continental Congress was constantly, year after year, making pleas for soldiers and offering different, more or less different contracts. Um, as we read about Joseph Plum Martin, you know, he time and again would re-enlist and would get some reward for doing so. But some soldiers would re-enlist, and then they would skip, you know, jump their contract, and kind of blend into the general public again, and then find in another neighborhood, another place, a place to re-enlist to get the benefits. So, yeah, I mean, some people are less scrupulous than others. Uh, I know after the failure of the Articles of Confederation that he decided to come back into power. What was the main decision that led him to come well, back you know, to the Constitution? It's interesting. Um, in 1785, George agreed to host a meeting at Mount Vernon so they could talk about navigation of the Chesapeake and the Delaware River. And you had delegates from uh, Virginia and from Maryland, from New Jersey there. 
And what they realized as they were talking about these, um, these navigation and trade issues, they realized that this was a much bigger question than just the co three colonies. So that's why you will get a convention the following year in Annapolis where they tried to bring all the colonies together and only about nine or so will show up in Annapolis and what they agree there is that they'll have another meeting in the spring of 1787 and you only get 12 of the colonies show up there, 12 of 13. Those Rhode Islanders just chose not to, not to play well with others. Other questions? Okay, guys. Uh, on Thursday, we'll come in. We'll talk about the Constitutional Convention, and then we'll wrap it up next Tuesday. Have a great, great day, guys.